This is Adam Lightman Bailey, and you are listening to The Real Talk Podcast. This is Jennifer Rodarte with Compass, and you're listening to The Real Talk Podcast. Hello, this is Steve, and we're with Wider Brothers of Compass in the D.C. metro area, and you're listening to The Real Talk Podcast. This is Jade with the Jessica Northrup team from Denver, Colorado, and you are listening to The Real Talk Podcast. All right, what's up, guys? Welcome to... A brand new episode of Real Talk. Today, I'm joined by Adam Lightman Bailey, who is actually one of the top attorneys in the United States. But before I go there, right now we're sitting in an awesome office space uh, here in uh, Financial District on the border of uh, Battery Park. And I guess it's a really nice office, probably about 20,000 square feet, uh, really nice finishes. We're overlooking right now uh, basically the Hudson River and the Statue of Liberty. So. Usually we do these recordings in my office in a little cave, but today we're uh, in definitely in one of the nicer, uh, nicer places that uh, we've recorded a podcast. And so uh, just to give you a quick introduction, Adam is, uh, again, one of the most distinguished real estate attorneys in America. Born in Bayside, Queens, he moved to California at the age of five and later moved back to New Jersey where he graduated with honors from Rutgers, then obtained his law degree from Syracuse University College of Law. Adam is an author of New York Times bestseller, Finding the Uncommon Deal. He was selected by the Chambers and Partners publication as New York's leading real estate lawyers and was named Super Lawyer by Law and Politics magazine. Adam has a long list of notable cases. To mention a few, he's represented uh, the developer Sharif Al-Gamal, who if you guys read the New York Post or the Times may be familiar, uh, he was the developer who proposed an Islamic mosque and cultural center near the Ground Zero site uh, where his opponents were the families affected by 9-11, firemen, politicians, and conservative media pundits. Uh, long story short, it turned into actually a, a brand new condominium called 45, 45 Park Place. Uh, Adam was responsible for obtaining the largest residential condominium settlement in the history of New York, as well as successfully relieved purchasers from quote-unquote bad deals or new developments, such as 20 Pine, the Brompton, the Trump Soho, and the Skyview Park. I can not go on long enough about Adam. I want him to jump in. So, Adam, welcome and thank you for joining today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here. I'm appreciative of your time. I feel like I'm fulfilled in life. You know? <laughs> I'm on a talk podcast. Live. <laughs> this is just a small step. This is great. This is a small step. How you been? For you, big step for mankind and me. You- <laughs> I stole that from uh, someone I met on the moon, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Let's start from the beginning. You, you are obviously one of the top lawyers in the States, but it was not, like anybody else, success is never a straight path. There are twists and turns and curves. When you were in your younger years, describe to me some of the things that had happened, your background. Right, so um, I, uh, I've i had a really rough road. I mean, it's never been easy. And I know, I, you didn't come from money. No, I, I came from poverty. Yeah. I, uh, I came from a horrible childhood, mm-hmm. every way you look at it. Yeah. And I credit that with, uh, any success that I've achieved. Mm -hmm. And I love talking about it because most people do not come from a silver spoon. Most people aren't handed, do not come from the Israeli army from one of your podcasts. Or the developer. Or parents parents or developers. You're an avid listener. This is great. Or or, or, uh, I don't get your newsletter. I don't know why I'm, I don't know why I'm excluded from that. Uh, We'll be sure to add Fine, okay. Danielle, tell tell Danielle. She's she's got to do it. You know, I, you know, I mean, you know, I, I, I've been uh, de- depraved from a lot of things in life, and I get used to that, but I just keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. But no, I mean, when I was five years old, my mother cheated on my father. My parents, lost, both my parents are teachers. My da- father's a gym teacher. My mother, fifth, my mother, fifth grade, and they lost their jobs in 1975. Wow. You could Google the Oceanville Brownsville strike, and you read all about it. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was no jobs, so my mother with a strange man, took me to California, looking for work. So I skipped At kindergarten. five years old, yeah. By five years old, I didn't go to kindergarten. Mm-hmm. And things were rough because my first landlord-tenant experience, which is one of the practices we do here, was moving from house to house or hotel to hotel because we couldn't find a place to live because we didn't have any money. There was no teacher jobs in California either. Did you understand that as a child? You, you didn't have money so you couldn't move. You didn't have money, so you couldn't buy a house. Yes, I understood it because I remember like going out to eat because there's no 
you know, kitchen in some of these places. Sure. So I understood always to order the the cheapest thing in the menu. Mm, wow. That's what, so that's you're what looking I mean. at menus so I remember, at that age. I remember, you know, as soon as I can read, I remember ordering the cheapest thing in the menu. Wow. I remember cockroaches. I remember, you know, I, I you know I remember getting beaten by my stepfather. Mm. I mean, I remember really really horrible things. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember getting bullied. You know, it's not a good good idea for a five year old to move from New York City. Queens to the West Coast. I understand it worked out okay for the Karate Kid. <laughs> you, went, you went through some they trial didn't put me tribulation. In karate. Too. They didn't put me in karate. No, they didn't. <laughs> and I didn't have Mr. Miyagi to uh, teach me how Dude. to uh, beat up the uh, big bullies. Uh, and, and they were blonde and they were big, but I, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't in there. You didn't have the proper mentors, you would say, when you were. Yeah, no, I, I, didn't learn how to, I didn't learn how to fight childhood. fast enough. I did learn how to take a punch. I didn't learn how to give a punch <laughs> yet. So what, what got you to move back to New Jersey? So when I was 13 years old, mm-hmm. um, I think because my family missed the, their family, they, they, they moved back uh, to New Milford, New Jersey, and, uh, which, which is really another really Did bad idea. Did life get better then? No, it got worse. It's really a bad oh, idea no. for, a, it was, I don't know what, how it is in California now, although I did visit up until 2015, but it's a really bad idea for a valley dude, which, you know, you're blonde hair yeah. and you're saying dude all the time for a valley dude from the, you know, from the movies, uh, um, Sean Penn movies, you know, you know, right. the valley dude, blonde hair, liking the go-go's to come back and everybody likes Metallica and <laughs> uh, 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 heavy metal and moving back at 13 to a different culture yeah. in, in New Jersey, yeah. which is another tough guy culture. It wasn't, that wasn't a good idea either, but it makes you very tough, right. very strong. And all of that helps build whatever I am today, which is a very goal-oriented, very um, strong-minded uh, uh, leader who doesn't depend on anyone but himself. And that's what I am today. Mm-hmm. Were you? Did you participate in sports as a kid? Were you? Uh, co- you're very competitive, clearly today. But obviously, you must have been competitive as a kid because of these things happening to you. Yeah, so I, I don't, I never really identified myself as competitive as a child, uh, but I did compete in sports. I started running at age five in camp. Mm. Mm. So I had to fly back every summer, the custody arrangements. I flew back to uh, camp. My dad was okay. a counselor, head counselor in a camp oh. um, called Camp Mishopa. And I flew back every summer and um, I started running with my father and I started running in events. And I realized that I could run for a long time, me and Forrest Gump. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep and running. I, and I ran and I ran and I ran and we ran every day and I ran at events and I realized that I, I wasn't really talented at most things, but I, I love sports and I like running and it, was, it felt good to, be, uh, to belong to something. Right. So when I started eighth grade at the Milford High School, I joined the track team. And I was the worst one on the team, <laughs> by far. Did that motivate you, propel you to become a better athlete, practice more, stay out late, longer, earlier, and stay out later? For some reason, my coach, Raymond Harrison, who becomes very important mm. later on, because our we have a scholarship program here sure. and, and a charity we own, and all of our scholarships are called the Raymond Hap Harrison Scholarships, named after my track coach, track coach track so coach. he was obviously yep. very important. Great. So, he uh, became very influential in my life. And he stood by me despite being the worst runner. Um, he either believed in me or just, uh, just kept saw me Saw your team. work ethic? Saw your determination? I don't know, think he saw anything. I just, <laughs> there was, just liked you. There was no cutting eighth, yeah. gra- there was no cutting eighth graders uh, off the team. And I just like belonging to something. They weren't beating me up on the team. You know? uh, it was like protection. You know? You're on a team that right. no one's beating up on the team. It was, worked out well. So, uh, no, but I stuck with it. And then uh, slowly I, I, I was improving. And I didn't, my father never really talked about his career, but he ran in high school um, at James Madison High School in Brooklyn, New York. And he ran with a guy, the track, captain of the track team you may have heard of. His, his name is Bernie Sanders. Wow. Yeah. He had this theory on a team that was kind of weird, though. He thought everyone should finish together at the same Bernie. time. 
Bernie Sanders. Okay. <laughs> and I said, Dad, that's socialism. And Seems my like. My dad pulled out the pictures of him and Bernie. Seems <laughs> very accurate. Yeah. So was he the fastest runner? I'm. I'm. He was. A, Bernie was the fastest runner in a team. That's amazing. He ran a mile like I, I ran a you mile. You can say that if you're the fastest runner, because if you're the fastest runner and everybody's finishing at the same time, you're probably winning states and championships. He and did well. My father was a sprinter. <laughs> yeah. Bernie was a long distance runner. My father uh -huh. actually was recruited to run in college. My father ran in Cortland College. So I didn't know it, that it was in my genes, because my father never spoke about it, and I didn't see him that often because we were in California. Yeah. But um, I didn't actually know I had running in my blood, but it was there. So com a competitive athlete was always in you. I never really felt like I was competing because track, in track and field and cross country, you know, long distance sure. running cross country, um, and you're finding yourself as a runner because the coach doesn't really know what you are in eighth and ninth grade. No. So you're, but really, what all all it is is it's a great sport because you're you're competing against yourself. And and my coach taught me. It's you against you. All you yeah. have to do is beat your he, best time. Your last time, sure. Mm -hmm. Beat yourself. It's mm -hmm. very, very simple. Mm -hmm. And then if you beat yourself, you're getting better and better. And all of a sudden, you're beating everybody else, and it gets better. So um, it that worked out. And what it worked out best with is I never became the runner that I should have become. I choked in the biggest meets. Was this in just in high school, middle school and high school? So I got... I became the captain of my track team in 10th grade. Mm -hmm. I got a varsity letter really early. I was already, I was a star in cross country and track in 10th grade, which is very odd. So I bloomed actually pretty early. But my junior year, I was supposed to be the state champion, and I wasn't, because I, I, um, I choked in the big meets my junior and senior year. Okay. So what it did was it taught me how to be a great leader. It taught me how to deal with defeat it taught me how to overcome odds. I was in a really bad car accident where I was in a short coma. Right, you, you had a bad concussion. Horrible concussion, co short coma. This was in I broke 10th most grade? of my bones. In, uh, this was my junior year, 11th junior grade. Year. What I happened? Bro I broke most of my what, bones. Were you driving? So I was in the back seat of the car mm -hmm. with my girlfriend at the time. I think my first girlfriend, one of my first girlfriends in my life, because I was not the best looking person, not that I am now. Um, yeah, but um, and we were on our way to a party, and it was the driver's one of his first. He just got his license. The driver just got his license, and we. He was a good friend of yours. It was rainy. He was a friend. It was yeah. raining, and we were on our way to a party, which is a rare thing for us to be invited to a party. And we um, went over the train tracks, and he flew into a bank, which is kind of ironic because I represent banks. <laughs> and uh, good joke. in in Bergenfield, New Jersey. Okay. Which is next to where we live in New Milford, New Jersey. And uh, that was. Did you have seatbelt on? No, it was, uh, we were in the back seat, which we didn't wear seatbelts in the back seat in, the, uh, in, in 1987. In the 80s. It was not oh. hurt, unheard of to wear Who a seatbelt. I broke bones. I, bro I have 37 oh. stitches in my head. I, um, so you had a coma. Coma was uh, weak. Oof. So not that bad. And then. Uh, God. That's pretty bad. Really not that bad. <laughs> no, I don't think it's, don't think it's, it's not that bad. It's always good and bad. I mean, in other words, I. One, Better than death. At that point, at 17 years old, the best looking girl I ever dated, uh, I met at Holy Name Hospital in Teaneck, New Jersey, because of that coma. Because I was wrapped in a cast. Everything was broken except yeah. my legs and my abs. And yeah. I had the best abs and legs of anyone alive. <laughs> because when, when you run the yeah. 70, 80 hours a week, when you're running that much, you have the best abs and your best legs. But your body's tiny because you're so skinny. Yeah. So everything else was wrapped because it was broken. Your head's wrapped. Sure. Your big nose is, you know, wrapped, you know, but, but your abs are, are steel and so are your legs and those look good. I got a girlfriend out of it, you know. Okay. All right. So see there's always benefits. Good. But no, seriously, the um but the girlfriend that was in the back seat, that's a, that was a different girl now? This is you so that Oh no, you that, don't you don't recover that ended the relationship. That was a short relationship, but you don't recover from you don't have anything to do with anyone in that car anymore. After you, that. You, you don't re first of all you don't you don't I didn't remember the accident. Anything that in that car was oh you know, that's over. Sure. And you're 17 years old. But, you know, girlfriend is a strong word. You know, what do you? What, okay. do you what, what does anyone know exactly? Yeah. It was one of the greatest things that could ever happen to me. What I overcame. So I literally started running with casts on. The accident was like in May or June, and by August I was running again with casts on <laughs> and a lot of pain, and a lot of oh pain. Oh my God. With blood. Every run had a lot of blood to it all over. 
I mean, your stitches were coming apart and stuff. Everything was a mess. I think the doctor probably said the you doc, shouldn't the doc, do that. The doctors were writing it up. <laughs> the doctors were writing it up as he needs mental help. <laughs> I've been to a psychiatrist once, like one episode, and that was during that time because they thought I was crazy. Nothing was stopping me from winning the cha- the state championship my uh, my senior year. Yeah, because I choked my junior year, mm-hmm. and uh, I was gonna and I and I knew if I didn't run during the summer, I wasn't gonna win it. Mm-hmm. Right. And I was determined to win it. So you ran in the summer so with I a ran. cast on. I ran with the cast on, two casts. Did what you had to do. My legs were fine. How was your head then? Yeah. My head? Yeah, because uh, you had, I'm sure you had stitches, you had swelling, you I had, had... I had to drop all my honors classes. I was in uh, almost all honors classes, if not all honors classes, and I had to drop them. Was it because put, you missed they, too much school? They put me in remedial classes. I, I missed a semester of school my junior year. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they, they passed me through, but I missed a semester. I think they just carried on my grades from the semester. How did that before. make you feel then, when you had to drop down? Um... I was the happiest person alive because I was I, because alive. I was alive. Yeah, I was alive. Yeah, yeah. Um, they told me I was lucky I was alive. My head hit the windshield. I mean, it Oof, broke the glass. Jeez. So you're you're lucky you're alive. You're the happiest person. Yeah. And yeah. I was able to run. Yeah. And uh, I read a lot of books and I uh, had to uh, get my brain back. When you get to, when you got to law school, why did you decide to go into law? where you wanted to be successful. You could have done Wall Street, you're right in New Jersey. You could have gone into some sort of engineering work. Why law? Remember, my parents are teachers. Yeah. I had never been a lawyer before, period. There's no, no lawyers in the middle of New Jersey that I knew about. Hmm. If, they're, if they're there, I, have, I still haven't met them. Sure. Um, if you go to New Milford's Wikipedia page, it's just me and Ed Marinaro, I think, listed. <laughs> he was on Hill Street Blues and he played pro football. Uh-huh. Really nice guy. Yeah. But it's not the town where you go to uh, become a lawyer, Wall Street, sure. or a hedge funder, okay. or anything else. It's a, right. it's a middle class, it's a street town, it's a middle caste town, it's a great, it's a great person town. Great town, blue collar, but nobody's blue there. Blue collar, be, but you're not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not there to become a hedge fund. Hedge fund, <laughs> hedge fund owner. So I, I didn't yeah. know anything about Wall Street. I, don't even, I wouldn't know what Wall Street was if you said it then. Um, I did read a book in seventh grade about John Peter Sanger. John Peter Zanger in 1735 was was arrested for seditious libel. He said bad things about um, the king's British governor, Bill Cosby. No relation to, to the Bill Cosby, the, the, the comedian. comedian, and other things mm-hmm. later on. And they brought in the best lawyers back then were not from uh, Adam Eitman and Bailey PC or another law firm. <laughs> You know, any uh, yep. s- any <laughs> stupid chance to plug our law firm, right? <laughs> uh, including a story about uh, you know why you picked law. No, um, so uh, they, the the best lawyers were Philadelphia lawyers. It's a famous phrase, you know, for in many movies. Yeah. Philadelphia lawyers, best lawyers. Yeah. So they brought in the best lawyer of the time, Andrew Hamilton, to come represent John there Peter Sanger for saying bad things about Bill Cosby. And I read a book on it. And his printing press is at Federal Hall right now. No, John Peter Zangers. Oh, okay. And uh, no, that's Alexander Hamilton. That's, that's Alexander Hamilton. If they're cousins, I don't know about yeah. it. But yeah. Andrew Hamilton came from Philadelphia. Yeah. Comes in and uses his words, and and he and they speak to a jury of, of people born in this country. They weren't Americans yet because it's 1735. Yeah. Not 1776. Mm-hmm. And they acquitted John Peter Zanger, even though truth wasn't a defense to libel then yet. Mm. In fact, in the same place where they had the trial, which is where Federal Hall is right mm-hmm. now, the same place where we had the launch of my book on how to buy your first home. Sure. Finding, finding, finding the uncommon, the uncommon deal. deal. Very good. Say, I had it there on purpose. It's the same place where they signed the Bill of Rights that actually gave you the right to have the First Amendment, which would have helped John Peter Zanger. This lawyer, using his words, free John Peter Zanger. And I love the way someone can use words to be powerful and help people. Yeah. So my thing of, I cannot stand injustice. Still today, I can't stand it. I fight for people's rights. And sometimes, as we know of one instance, I go over the line, but I can't stand injustice and I fight for people's rights and that's what I'm paid to do. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And I love setting up for people's rights. And I love doing the right thing. And I love the power of what a lawyers can do. And on that day, I fell in love with being a lawyer. And then soon after, I, I learned that I can't be a lawyer because that's for rich people. And law school costs a lot of money and yes. I don't have any. Yes. So I had it in my mind I want to be a lawyer and then I put it on hold because 
I have to be a journalist because I can't be a lawyer because that's rich people. Mm -hmm. But that was the goal. Mm -hmm. And all these other professions you're naming about how to be rich, I never had a goal of being rich. Even today, I, I just being rich was never my goal. The goal was to be Not successful, be to be able to feed my family and myself, but to have meaning in life and to help people. That was always my goal. How did you put yourself through law school? Did you did you end up taking student loans? Did you loans, work after one hundred twenty thousand dollars of loans? But did you? How did you do that? Just and you I applied worked. through school and. I and worked, yeah. mm -hmm. Um, I learned about loans and I applied for, uh, and they paid for almost everything. Okay. And then I worked in the side. Good. I, uh, Good. I worked for Barbary and I got a free bar review class uh -huh. and then I tutored. Um, I mean, I did all kinds of jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Everything, I, any, anything that I would pay. I did Good. that in college too. Good. Good. I, uh, I taught the SAT for Kaplan during college. So I would teach kids, um, how to study for the SAT. Did you ask the SATs uh, when you were in high school? Uh, I don't have no memory of that. Yeah, yeah. And now the scoring system is all different now too. So like some of the younger listeners probably don't even know how they scored in the '90s versus the 2000s versus the '80s. So, but that's good to know. So you always had that hustle mentality of whatever it takes to achieve your goal, whether regardless of the obstacles, whether it's financial, whether it's time, whether it's per personally speaking. The the moral of the story is there's always a way to find the end. It just is never a straight path. And that's what I've seen with Adam based on just reading his background. Let's switch gears a little bit. After graduation, it still wasn't easy for you. You got, you passed the bar, you're a lawyer now, but now what? So I, I graduated Syracuse Law, the most incredible law school with the most incredible education. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that that's the school that I went to. <laughs> um, I did really well in college, but I didn't do well on the LSAT. But I was so happy that I went to Syracuse because the education couldn't be any better. The school was known for its trial programs. I wanted to be a trial attorney and I wanted to do real estate. Mm -hmm. I loved the real estate classes. I loved my real property class. And I did a clinic called the Housing and Finance Clinic with my professor, Deborah Ken, who uh, featured me in a chapter in her book later on. And, um, and we're still close friends today. Mm -hmm. uh, I just fell in love with real estate. And I loved the fact that it was just, just so intellectually stimulating, especially in New York City where you have to find the, find how to fit 8 million people living in one city and all the fascinating regulations on how to allow people to function sure. together. Yeah. And then litigation, I just, uh, um, I was on a special all-star team called the Moot Court Team. So I knew I had a natural ability to litigate and persuade and those two came together, litigation and, and real estate. And, uh, and Syracuse is the top school for litigation sure. that I understood to be. Yeah, yeah. And I had a teacher, professor called Travis Lewin, that was considered the best professor in the nation for litigation. I made his all-star team called the Mucor team. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, uh, I just got very fortunate and lucky um, to do that. To join that team right. and was able to. Right. So of course I come out and I get a job right away. No, that didn't happen. No, because my life doesn't go that easy. <laughs> it's never that easy. No. Was it nine months? Nine months. Nine months to get a job. What was it? Bad economy then? So what? I'm the top twenty percent of my class. Yeah. I'm in a special trial program. Should be getting a job really easy, and no, no one would hire me. But then again, I turned down offers because I wouldn't do personal injury. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the stomach for it. I wouldn't do family law. I, I, I mean, I cry all the time in movies. I mean, it's really easy to get me to cry. <laughs> so I couldn't handle that. And I really wanted to do real estate. And I really wanted to litigate. Right. And ha finding those two together wasn't going to work. And I wasn't really made for the big firms. I was made to fight for people's rights. So Maybe I, not a cultural fit is what you're saying. I don't know. It just, they're just, you know, Jay Gatsby, as Scott Fitzgerald wrote, the rich are different than you and me. You know, it, it, it's a club. Yeah. And, uh... I mean, yeah. you have my background, think about it. I don't have any connections. Right. Zero connections. No country club mentality from Connecticut. There's no one from New, <laughs> from New Jersey that became a lawyer. <laughs> I'm the only one. Right, right. No right. country clubs. I don't. I never heard of any country clubs. Right. You didn't know the word brunch until you were probably in your 20s. I knew brunch. <laughs> I knew the word brunch, but I had never had sushi before. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I definitely, and I learned the word, what was it, caviar? I never had caviar <laughs> up until uh, much, 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 much later. I love it. Okay. So I, yeah. I, I and um, private school, I hadn't met anybody from private school yet. 
So I, I, I was different than, you know, the rich are different than you and yeah. me, and I was definitely the, I wouldn't have hired me either. Tell me the story yeah. about you had met, you knew one attorney, that attorney took you out for lunch and you were nervous and he said a word that you weren't familiar with and you ordered. I made a mistake. <laughs> this is great. I made a bad mistake. Yeah. So my dad somehow knew an attorney. My dad, the gym teacher. Yeah. My dad, who told me never to become an attorney because it's too risky. My dad, who said, become a teacher like all of us. My whole family is teachers. Because it's safe. My yeah. grandparents. Secure. My grandma was a secretary in the Board of Education. My, my step-parents, my parents, all teachers. Yeah. My sister, two sisters, teachers. Everybody's a teacher. Why don't you go get your substitute license? You can't get a job. <laughs> Adam, you weren't made to be a lawyer. We don't ever have a lawyer in our family before. How can you be a lawyer? Yeah. So I... So he finally gets someone to take me to lunch. Of course, that guy's now in jail. He's a convicted felon. Oh, God. Not that kidding. Part, I did not know that part. But he finally gets someone to take me to lunch. Finally, I have my first connection. I, I was just so honored that someone would take me to lunch. He's in Long Island. Uh -huh. And I go out there. I wanted to fit in. So he orders a drink. He probably said the word Perrier. <laughs> I thought he was ordering an alcoholic beverage, and I wanted to fit in. So I think I ordered a gin and tonic. <laughs> And he says, oh, that's interesting. And uh, We had a party at one of hands. So that, that was the end of the getting that job. Oh, boy. I guess he ordered some French water, and I ordered a, a hard drink on an interview. And, uh, yep, I didn't get that job. The, the irony of this story is you're not really a drinker. I don't even drink. You don't drink. So, I, I mean, I will drink socially. Like, if I go out and everybody's ordering a drink, I, I will drink uh, socially. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm not against drinking. I'm all for having a drink but most of the time everybody's drinking i'm going to be working when i get home like anyway, when people I go out totally understand for dinner i'm i'm going back to work yeah so yeah. it's very rare that i'm people are going for drinks and i'm not going back to work i cannot work on a drink yeah i can have maybe one glass of wine and still work but i'm still not as effective that is sharp right yeah. and i need to really be sharp and getting drunk is never happening because then i'm not as good the next day and i need like for my trial on tuesday i need to have everything together we have to be perfect. We have a multi-million case in the line, and we better be the best we can possibly be. Remember, because I'm not. I'm not just working. I'm working on cases. I'm also writing. Yep. I'm writing. I'm over writing a book that's 2,400 pages. Okay. With 34 authors, I'm the editor, co-editor in chief. Right. Uh, on advanced real estate law, law mm -hmm. called real estate titles for um, for real estate lawyers. Okay. So I'm really trying to improve. I'm trying to improve real estate for all of New York. I got it. Not just for our firm, but for all of New York, mm -hmm. which is very important to me. Right. To improve our community, to improve New York at all times. Right. For the audience, let's talk a little bit more about today's topics, maybe some cases that you're working on now, but also some of the wins that you've had in the past. We talked a lot about your losses, so we know. <laughs> we know you got beat up. I want some of your thoughts. First topic I want to discuss is when you first began your real estate career, attorney career, you were a L&T attorney, a landlord-tenant attorney, correct? Well, I, well the, the first firm was called Winsig and Winsig, and we did real estate litigation, mm -hmm. and we did real estate transactions. Okay. So we didn't do landlord tenant yet, and and I was at that firm for two years. When did you so, shift into that? So I I realized after two years I said I can't complete my real estate training. You know, I was a young Jedi, and I can't complete my real estate training unless I learn landlord tenant. Yeah. So I actually only left the firm, and I love that firm, and I'm still in touch with my former boss. Right. Yeah. But I can't complete my Jedi training unless I went to a landlord tenant firm. Correct. So I looked, I researched the best landlord tenant firm in New York at the time, and I found it, and I applied to them, and I got the job, and then I could, and then I worked there for a little over two years or two years, and uh, and then I started my own firm. In how my many cases year. did you think? Did you would you say how many cases did you have at that L&T firm? How many times did you go to court? Well, um, no, every day. Every day, okay. Yeah. So you have, an ex you have a lot of experience in this. The publications out there, they don't really talk too much about your L&T background, at least online, when you, when you initial Google oh, search on you. Yeah. But there's more about you know, everything in the real deal and whatnot, but not so much L&T. Now, I want to touch on this for a few minutes because it's very important, not even if the listener right now is in real estate, but if they're living in New York City. So the, legis the Albany changed a lot last year in the summer and, <laughs> and and it, it basically flipped the rental game upside down now it affects everybody in different ways if you're a stabilized tenant or rent control tenant it affects you tremendously but if you're a landlord it also affects you a free market landlord 
owning one condo or one co-op, it also affects you as well. Long story short, what are your thoughts on the effects of rent control and rent stabilized tenants? And are you more pro landlord uh, about the, with the law change? Are you more pro tenant about the law change? And also, the second part of the question is, what about for the individual condo and co-op co owners who aren't making that much money to begin with are now at a higher risk because of the laws changed? That's a complex question, but I'll two I'll two part do my question. Best. Yeah, I feel like six, but I'll six. Do my best. <laughs> so okay. um, we represent landlords and tenants both, but most of the tenants are represented extremely wealthy. Just to be blunt. Mm -hmm. Or the tenants, oh, because they hire you, they're wealthy? Or? When, when the tenants are hiring us, they're usually co-op shareholders mm -hmm. or sure. tenants that have a lot of money that want to keep their apartments. Right. Or the tenant associations where there are a group of tenants hiring us. Mm -hmm. On the landlord side, it's landlords that just want to win. Yep. Okay. So remember, the law hurts tenants sometimes even more than it hurts landlords. Even though the law is meant to protect the tenants. Right, but it doesn't protect them. How let so? Me, let me give you an example. The law says that you can't deregulate apartments anymore, meaning you can't take them out of rent regulation. You cannot. Right. So three times this week, we got we received calls from tenants, and one of the major ways we used to make money was called buyouts. Yeah. Where a tenant would want to leave their apartment, and the landlord would give them sometimes or average a million dollars to leave. So I got a call from one tenant who I won a case for, a major case for, 10 years ago. And they said, my wife is having trouble hearing. Um, we need to move out. Sure. And I go, did you hear about what happened in June yeah. the 14th? Yeah. And they go, no, we don't turn on the internet. We're scared of it. <laughs> well, uh, let me, let me, you're going to get like $10,000. You mean we're not getting the million dollars that they offered us 10 years ago? No. And that ship they, has they, sailed. They started crying. The average rent regulated tenant is 68 years old. Yeah. If you're on a fourth floor walk up or third floor walk up, how many years they th you think can they walk up four flights of stairs nope. with nope. groceries? Nope. So they, they're getting hurt the most because they don't have their meal ticket to go buy a place in Florida with the money they would get here. 100%. So you're hurting them the most. So these tenants at 68 years old may need to move to homes or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. They're now getting $10,000 to leave or twenty. So you, they're getting hurt really badly. The laws don't help these tenants. They, the, the laws that were passed didn't think about the tenants. I don't know what who they were thinking about. Why was it passed then? Who does it benefit really? The younger it's a, stabilized it's a, it's tenants? A, it's a really long story of why it was passed, which I, which I could go into on a different area. Maybe a different episode. But not today. <laughs> but the bottom line is it wasn't thought out. Yeah. And they need it should be changed immediately. But when I speak to the, state, the legislatures, because I'm friends with all of them, I mean, not friends, but either friends or acquaintances or, you know, we used to donate to all their campaigns in some yeah, capacity. Sure. We have fundraisers here all the time because it's obviously when you see it's 26,000 square feet of beautiful space. <laughs> I to said 20,000 square feet. I was wrong. No, no, I'm just saying six more thousand. It's, <laughs> it's, it's beautiful space to have fundraisers. Very. Um, so, and, and, there's, and their goal is to keep the rent low. The rent is too damn high. And too damn high. I, 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 thought, I, I agree with them. If you want to control rents to keep them down, yeah. fine, do that. Yeah. But what they did by stopping rents from being decontrolled is you're taking away the tenant's ability to move to homes that they could they could afford yes. and get the care they need now that they're old. Because the average rent rate mm -hmm. tenant is 68. And there's very few tenants that are younger. Because they have success, succeeding tenants. Tenants that pass their apartment on to their kids doesn't usually happen. No. Because the kids don't want to live with their parents for two years, no. like they have to do. So when they when, so when they go to college, when they go to Lehigh, <laughs> two Lehigh graduates in the house, three like, actually. Sorry, oh, you went to Lehigh too? as well. I didn't know. Congratulations! <laughs> great school. All the connections. Great, great school. Great so, school. The real estate. Lehigh Lafayette. Great. Lehigh Lafayette. There you go. Yeah. All right. That's right. That's go. right. She was just there. Let's do it. Oh, good yeah. for you. That's right. The recent game. It's one, like the last game, second to last game of the season or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. November. Got it. Mm -hmm. November. Got yeah, you're smart. You know, you know it all. Hey, you got to, got to know your stuff. Got to know. Okay. <laughs> On top of it. Right, so, um, but they, 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 you know, the the law. If you want to limit rents, fine, but don't hurt the people in the process. So allow deregulation, and if you if you allow tenants to be deregulated, and and then you give landlords bonuses for improving apartments. Sure. That gives 
middle class people jobs like my family. Yeah. It gives them jobs. Yeah. I, I'm one of six. So it gives my family members jobs, the contractors jobs to build, build up these places instead of just leaving them to rot. Yeah. So that gives jobs. It gives incentives for buyouts and it helps them a lot. If you want to put on controls and, and limit, you know, the rent each year to 5%, Fine. Mm -hmm. That's that's really the tenant's biggest worry is to be priced out of Manhattan. Right. I understand that. Right. Go do that. But you're hurting tenant. You're hurting the landlords and tenants a lot by doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And even that's bad for the landlords because what you need. I mean, almost all my clients are no longer investing in Manhattan anymore, or a lot of them. The multifamily market is dead. Right. Yeah. It's thawed right now. It's it's dead. It's thawed. Mm -hmm. But the, the number one reason isn't so much these laws. Even commercial is thought out right now. Yeah. It's not just these laws, but it's one thing you need as an investor and if you're a government. It's one thing that the average citizen needs what is in that? a country, in every country in, in, in the world. And that is credibility, stability, mm -hmm. dependability of this future. Yes. Those three. And if you have those, you're going to believe in your, your government. And when you don't believe in your government, people are going to run. And right now, they're not believing in New York. And it's really scary out there. What do you think about Amazon getting kicked out? I mean, it's such a policy-driven state, New York. I'm not just saying we're socialists, New York's socialist, but it is a policy-driven state where businesses get pushed out. So it, it's, it was a horrible, a horrible thing when not only did they get pushed out, but the way we treated a business. Yeah. That when we're saying we hate landlords, we're saying we hate business. Businesses. We hate, go our government hates Business. A landlord job is not easy. And this this it's it is a family business, it's a multifamily business, it's a read I mean, these are businesses. It's the really, pension really funds. Bad. Yeah. It's really, really bad. It's but, bad. But, but amazing thing what happening is even with that, all the major colleges still came and built. All the major businesses, even Amazon came and put a still rented and they have a couple hundred Midtown. thousand feet. Yeah. Still small, but mm -hmm. but Google and LinkedIn Facebook. and all the others, they still came big time. Mm -hmm. So the businesses are still coming. Why? Because we build vertically here. Mm -hmm. When you build vertically, the talent's here. Yeah. And the businesses need the talent. As much as the government's kicking you in the teeth, the businesses are still coming. So it's just amazing. As, as badly as they're treating us, we're still coming back for more. It's like, you know, the person is beating the spouse and they're still coming back coming for back. more. <laughs> it's, it's disgusting. It shows resilience. It, show, it, it shows resilience, but, it just, yeah. but it, it's got to be changed. Sure. On the negative side, they're coming back for more, but they're just going to get beaten up again until we show decay and problems. But, yeah. but what you haven't mentioned is even a bigger problem. People will not stay in New York if crime goes up. And they just changed the criminal laws where you can't keep people on bail. It's very hard, difficult on bail. Reform. And they changed a whole bunch of other laws yep. where if someone's a public danger to society, you can't consider that as a factor to keep them on bail. Yeah. So the criminal laws have changed. Yeah. They, it's very hard to, to, to even convict someone of a crime now unless they've done something severe. So you have to uh, let them go. This could hurt New York as well. Sure, sure. So we're in for we're in for some trouble. Well, we'll see what the future holds. I want to switch gears now because I know you have to run soon. But you had some really interesting cases that hit the newspapers as of late. One that really, one in particular that many of you heard, and the one that actually I really am interested in hearing, learning more about, the Linda Macalow case mm -hmm. where you were representing. I believe the wife in Linda. The, in Linda. Linda in the 432 Park property. Well, we represented her in the, her divorce. Believe it or not, we were on a divorce team. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally did the trial on the apartment case. Got it. And, and for listeners, this is one of the most expensive divorce cases in the history. No, it is the most expensive divorce well, the, case. Well, the Be Bezos Amazon divorce cases. No, it's a big compare. No, th this one went to trial. Bezos didn't it, go to trial. They didn't go to trial. So this one is the most expensive that went to trial. Uh, so to tell us a little bit about how, in what capacity you were working with Linda and what was some of your, uh, your strategies and the, and the work that you've done on that, on, on that trial. We came in in the middle of the divorce trial mm -hmm. without reasons I, I can't go into, but what we realized when we first came in was this is not a divorce trial because this, this, they've been married for 30 years. It's just going to be, it's just a matter of math. Uh -huh. It's a matter of uh, assessing assets yeah. and what they're worth. Mm -hmm. It's a real estate trial. It's assessing real estate, and one party wants real estate to be worth as little as possible, and one side <laughs> wants it to be worth as much as possible. Sure. So a matter of how good are you are at assessing ma at assessing real estate. Sure. So we realized 
I realize that the real estate attorneys are more important than divorce attorneys. Interesting. Because it's not about divorce. It's about real estate. Sure. On the so, apartment. So you didn't get involved you know. in, they have multiple homes, but there was also a discussion, I believe, on the post about artwork and obviously, you know, finding you know, bank accounts and several accounts of money here and there. <laughs> did did no. you have to? Oh. So I, I can't, I got to be careful because it's a trying to client privilege. Sure. But remember, ev everything is very simple. You're, you're, you need experts to assess everything and tell you the value. Yeah. And one party wants it to be as high as possible, and one party wants it to be as low as possible. We only know real estate. Yeah. So, but remember, Harry Mackle is a genius. Okay? Indeed. Now, I was quoted in the New York Post as calling him a shyster during the trial. Uh huh. Okay? But he's a genius. Yeah. He's also one of the funniest men you ever meet in your life. I heard he had some really funny comments he, during he, the entire he, trial. He is hilarious. In and out of the courthouse. Yes. He is hilarious. Yeah. He's, and, and, uh, and, um, and they had one of the greatest love affairs of all time. They, they really did. Uh -huh. um, and uh, if everyone should be so lucky to have such, have such a great love affair. But um, I'll give you one story that um, most people don't know, which is disgusting. So we won my trial. Mm -hmm. She got to make a decision to keep the apartment. We won. She got to, to keep the apartment at 432 Park yeah. Avenue. So it was either her choice. She could either get her money back or actually close in the apartment. Mm -hmm. And Harry was very unhappy about that because Harry's very competitive. And Linda was very happy she won because when you're worth billions of dollars, it doesn't really matter about... A somebody, million here. Right. A it, million it, it there. It matters winning and losing. You, you know, you're right. Shot. So people, it was public in the front page of the Post. Yeah, that, multiple times. That, yeah, well, it was not every day, but <laughs> it was on the post of the picture of the new, of Harry's new wife. Yeah. Did you see where they put the picture? No, I remember. Of her on the building, 432 Park. They put it on the apartment that we won the case on. Oh, picture. wow. It's kind of disgusting. No matter for 30 years, and just because we won that case, she, they put a picture of her on the apartment that we won. Wow. It's kind of disgusting after 30 years that you do that. Jeez. What they say, revenge is best served on a cold that, dish. That never made the paper. I mean, the picture did, but the reason behind did. it didn't. Yeah. Right. yeah, but the, the story behind first, it never made uh -huh. it. First heard on the, the TAC podcast. The Real Talk podcast. Real, what, Real Talk podcast. What was thing. your takeaway? What did you learn from? I mean, I'm sure every, you learned something in every trial. What, did you, what was your takeaway from that trial? I knew Harry was a genius. I, I dealt with Harry many times. Many in times, past. yeah. In fact, I have an ongoing lawsuit now with him. I've oh. been with several lawsuits with him over the years. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we uh, you know, I mean, it's like, uh, it's like dating. We, we, we uh, it's like dating on and off for several years. We have lawsuits constantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know, sure. He's, he's always helping me make a lot of money. I sure. appreciate it. Thank you, Harry, <laughs> if you're listening. But did you have, a, like, one takeaway from that specific divorce case? It's not, that's something I did, it's not that I didn't know it. I just learned that money isn't, you know, it's a cliche, money isn't everything. And um, I did learn something very deep and meaningful about how money isn't everything, yet how important money is to some people. Mm -hmm. But I can't tell you why, because it's attorney client privilege. Right. But I learned sure. something very, very deep that I can't talk about, but it was so deep that it's really affected me since. Okay. And okay. I wish I could talk about it. Okay. But that no attorney worries. client privilege thing, <laughs> you have to take it to the grave. Yeah. You do, you, you do. You know, I, I, yeah. I get bruises sometimes because my wife hits me so hard. Because all of a sudden she'll be reading the paper or something, or, or on, never on the paper, but online, and she'll see my name that I'm representing blank, and she'll start hitting me. You represent, like, it's her favorite actress or something. Uh -huh. You're representing blank and this and that, or, or some guy who's an actor. You're representing oh blank and this and that, and you didn't tell me, blah, blah, blah. Like, and then I'm like, I'm not allowed to, honey. And yeah. Tush, tush, tush. Yeah. You couldn't tell me that, you know. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of situations that you're put in that are uncomfortable because you can't talk about it anymore. I feel fine. I, feel I, I, I keep it's secrets for a living. I, keeping secrets is my trade. Sure. And I have no life. problem keeping secrets. And that's, what I, that's what I do. Uh, a few more minutes here. Uh, I, I did want to talk about uh, another uh, interesting case uh, with Trump. You had it. You had. Who's he? I'm kidding. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you, you had an involvement with Trump. Do you have a Trump few minutes Soho. on that? Trump Soho. Yeah. Well, um, now that he's president, hot topic. But. Oh, well, it, it was it, it was really wild because I represent the Kushner family. Yeah. And I rep I've been representing Jared Kushner since 2002. And I had him on trial when he was a young boy, young kid. I don't read People Magazine. I don't really, I don't, not many people do. I don't read any of the Us Magazine or any of those. E, I don't that, know if it's e -TV out there. or? So I sued 
Ivanka. Ivanka goes in The Apprentice, and she announces that Trump Soho is just about sold out or sold out or one of yep. the two. And we discover right away that only 15.8% sold out. Oof. And by the way, that case changed brokering. Dramatically. Marketing. Forever. Never again has a brokerage ever exaggerated sales in any development, thanks to the Trump Soho case. Yeah. That stopped it. Yep. But at that time, people were exaggerating. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I get a call from Jared, and he's screaming at me. And screaming. And I said, Jared, I didn't even know you guys were dating. I had no idea. How would I know these things? <laughs> it's in every... Do- I don't read these things. I had no idea. Well, you read the posts. I don't even read the posts. He's talking about the posts all the time. I don't read the posts. Okay. All right, all right. I read the posts of a minute, and I don't even like being in the posts. <laughs> All right, so you read the real deal, and that's about it. You read the, you read. I get the emails, the real deal. I read it. I, I'm reading the post if I'm in it. Yeah. Um, okay. So Jay's mad. I mean, I mean, no, no. I mean, I, I just, I just didn't know. And once I'm representing, so I represented a group of people that had put down down payments because they relied, you know, a lot of Europeans, some famous soccer players, yep. some famous people that weren't even named, but sure. a lot of big wigs and a big group of people, like 30 people, and they wanted their money back because they thought it was almost sold out and they made a bad investment. They went crazy. So I, I the group was organized. They hired me. Or I organized the group. I, they kept calling. Because mm-hmm. I was known, I was known first for... When buildings were built badly, I became the it attorney for getting them fixed. Then, in 2007 forward, I found a statute that no one had ever used before in New York called the Interstate Land Successful Disclosure Act for getting people out of contracts, which I didn't really do that much of. Mm -hmm. I mostly got them discounts where the banks pulled the funding on the ability of people to buy homes. And I, we're still doing this today. We're just doing it quietly because we get people sign, have a signed um, confidentiality, confidentiality agreement. Yep. Just, we yep. found new ways today. Yep. But um, we found way, we found the statute that allowed people out of their contracts. What we really did was we got 40% off. A lot, that matched what the bank would give them in lending, and they closed in their apartments. And they closed anyway. That's what happened mostly. Perfect. We had more closings going on here than anywhere else. Yeah. I yep. believe. I mean, I may, I may, at that point I may, in time, I may be wrong in that. But, but at that I point, you were doing bulk closings. We were doing a lot of closings. Yeah. So, um, so that led to a lot of other cases like Trump Soho, where we sued the Trump family. But I immediately saw that this was criminal fraud. So I contacted the DA's office, mm-hmm. and they started the criminal case. And then Ivanka was brought down with the boys, and that made everybody crazy. Did you have dealings with Michael Cohen then? Was he involved in... Yeah, so I, I was in touch with Michael Cohen right away. Wow. Now, I've always liked Michael Cohen. I've known him for many, many years. Oh, is that right? He's always been a straight-up guy. We've Interesting. Done, we've done... Um, you know, I mean, I've sued um, the Trump family like seven times on small-time landlord tenant stuff. Okay. So and Michael Cohen is involved in all of those? No, very few. Michael Cohen oh. didn't get involved with the Trump family, I think, until 2008, 9, 10. Okay. He, was okay. not, he was not a 20-year attorney like people think. He, he was a recent addition to the Trump family. Gotcha. 2008, 9, 10, he was involved. Mm-hmm. So, but he was always a straight-up... But I knew him as a, as a taxi medallion attorney, because I, I represent Taxi King. There's a uh, there's a guy yes the taxi king yes, so I knew Michael Cohen and and he would re- he would be on small time cases not associated with Trump some with Trump got so it I did I, so I you was, didn't know I him was a real state he was not involved in Trump Soho got it got he it he was not involved with Trump Soho got it but a lot of other people were mm-hmm. and um, but that case started and it went on and um, I sent it to the DA right away and they jumped in right away and then we didn't hear from him a long time and then they jumped in and then. <laughs> But I settled the case. And once I settled a case, I keep my word. And part of my word was I wasn't, once I settled a case, I'm not cooperating with the DA. Right. And I agreed as part of the settlement to write a letter to the DA that I don't think this is a good criminal case. Right. I have no idea. I'm not a criminal attorney. Right. I, I don't, and can't I wrote, really get involved in it. Yeah. So, so then Vance, the D, DA Vance, um, when they asked him why he didn't prosecute the Trump family, he blamed Adam Light and Bailey. This oh. is public. So then I released a letter. It became a or fight. Or someone then. released a letter. Right, but it became I guess, a I guess, public fight. I guess Trump released a letter. Yeah. Trump saying, which is only two sentences. Or, or the real deal released that, wherever they got it from. Yeah. They, they, maybe me, maybe them, I don't remember. But, and it didn't say anything. But Vance blamed me for not prosecuting them. Uh-huh. Like, I'm a criminal expert. Like, I know. <laughs> so it was kind of weird. Yeah. And then um, no one went to jail on that. Good. 
It all, all, all ends well. So we're at because the It's creative lawyering. When you get a case, many lawyers just go through the motions of the file and hope yep. it goes well. We're looking outside the box. Yep. We're here to fight for our clients zealously and do whatever it takes to win ethically and legally, mm -hmm. period. You heard it here, guys. Uh, do you clearly- on the talk broadcast. On the talk podcast. 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 You know, you could really- It should be a broadcast because it should be on TV anyway. Uh -huh. <laughs> I really like the, the, the passion that, that uh, Adam has, especially when he talks about cases. You, you could see the voice level go up a little bit. So his octave is a little bit higher and the, uh, the, you feel the passion and intensity immediately. Uh, a couple questions, rapid fire, okay? These are rapid fire questions. Mm -hmm. If you had a million dollars cash right now to invest in real estate, what would you buy, where and why? New York City, mm -hmm. Upper East Side, okay. multifamily. Well, not for a million bucks. <laughs> you can't buy, you, maybe for five stay, million. Stay tuned. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> stabilized, stabilized. Stabilized, absolutely okay. stabilized. All right, what about if you had five million, what would you buy? Same thing. Same thing. Maybe a couple more. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I believe in New York <clears throat> and I believe in rent regulation. Good. When, that where do you live it. now? What neighborhood are you living? I live on uh, Upper East Side. Upper East Side. Okay. So that's your full-time residence. You're, you're a true full -time, night. Yeah. Okay. Good. And then <clears throat> uh, favorite restaurant in New York City? My favorite restaurant is La Pagratidian. In which neighborhood? That's my go-to. Wherever it is. Where's that? Great Wi-Fi. <laughs> Great Wi-Fi. Great place to work. I love healthy food, uh -huh. and um, the great lattes there. Okay, good. That was, that was my next question. I was gonna ask. Most people ask, "What's your favorite bar?" But since you don't drink, you have a favorite cafe. Wait, wait favorite bar? Um, I don't, wait, what's the best bar? You no, know, I don't know. <laughs> you don't even drink. No, favorite cafe. Do you have a favorite cafe? Um, I, I used to ban Starbucks because I always like going to the deli across the street. Yeah. But because of the Wi-Fi and ability to get work done, I like. <laughs> You know, Starbucks, La Pocatillion, anywhere, anywhere I can get work So your establishment is basically, your favorite establishment is as long as they have good Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi <laughs> and room to work and uh, and then I always want to buy whatever they have, coffee and, okay. and healthy food. Healthy food, as long as they have Wi-Fi and healthy so remember, food. Remember, um, La Pocatillion is better than Starbucks because they have avocado and healthy, yep. you could buy things that are healthy there, so that's yep. why I like it better than Starbucks. Okay, okay. Uh, final question. You were. First time I saw you was at the 2011 Multifamily Summit, Massinaco, when they were Massinaco. You were a panelist there with Rudin. Wasn't that ugly? They were all killing me. Oh, and man. I you was were right. getting murdered. I was right. I, I really I, liked your enthusiasm. I was talking about the end of rent regulation, and yep. they were like, oh, well, that's never going to happen. And yep. Yep. You were getting killed. And then someone. But the panelists were all. Someone that went to that lecture, you know the backstory of that? No. Someone that attended that lecture then sued based on what they heard there and went to the United States Supreme Court. Oh, my God. Challenged rent regulation. That wasn't that crazy? Wow. And they were all poo-pooing me, and some guy listened and went to it and followed it. <laughs> and I went to United States Supreme Court and almost won. If they would have, instead of poo-pooing me, if they would have gathered and done that they, and done better briefs, they probably would have gotten different. rid of rent regulation. Yeah. 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 Things Maybe we different. shouldn't always, like, you know, make fun of the guy you disagree with. Maybe sometimes listen a little carefully. <laughs> Maybe that's it. You had a big day. They were going after me, right? No, they were. They were. And and, and, and now, now they don't. Now now they're my clients. Well, now Massey Nackle doesn't even exist and that, that multifamily now, stuff is now not they're good. All, they're all it's my, not even good. That whole thing, my whole bench is my clients. I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. But that was good. You. But that was good. I interrupted you. No, no, no. So, so you first attended that and go yeah, ahead. And that was, that, that was great. You were a great panelist. Uh, I think you should do more of that if there is another one that is similar to that. In Minsk, you, didn't, you didn't go to the... You didn't go to the... that night, too. I went that night, too. Oh, there was a recent one where uh, we were, it was about rent regulation that um, Dansker put on from Mark Smilichap. Oh, you did? Okay. And it, had, it was that. me and a State Senator. Um, Sh Schumer? No, it was a State Senator and a City Councilman, Levine, mm -hmm. and one of the leaders of the uh, tenant movement. Okay. From the uh, State Representing Senate. Representing the tenants. State Senate, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, was in, it was in between that. It was a good debate. And um, a commercial broker. Okay. Okay. Well, I get to attend the next one. Um, and then the, the, the other one that I loved you did that night, same night in 2000, 2011, was the real deal with the debate, you right. and Stuart Saft. You, were, you had like a foot picture of you guys boxing it out. And Mackle's son. Bill, Billy's a great guy. He's, a, he's really funny. He's a fantastic human being. Is that right? B Billy Mackle. Yeah. He's, uh, he's also married to another big time... Julie. Big time real estate. No? Julie Mackle does, some, does her own business. Just something else. Okay. All right. But that was a great that was a great night. Um, those were some of my great memories. I was of at you Lincoln first, Center. It was the main hall at Lincoln Avery Center. Avery Fisher Hall. Avery Fisher Hall. Yes, sir. Right. It was a good time. Did you enjoy uh, battling out Stuart Saft? You kind of. I feel like he's a. He's soft, a phenomenal attorney. Phenomenal soft spoken attorney. guy. Maybe not a debater. 
Phenomenal attorney. Attorney. But sure. it was, the only thing was a little unfair. I had to, <laughs> I had to debate in front of 5,000 brokers on whether real estate litigation is a good idea. <laughs> and how, fair, it, it, how fair is that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. all right, guys, I, I know you're busy. Uh, we're going to wrap up here. This is a one-hour podcast, so actually one of the longest episodes to date. After post-production, it'll probably be about an hour. So, um, Adam, thank you so much for thank the time. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And, thank you for uh, having thank me. Thank you, thank Great you for, honor. Thank, thank you, you for coming on the Real Talk Podcast. It's the Real Talk Broad Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when are we doing TV to become the broadcast? The, we, I, we do have an Instagram TV channel called Talk TV. But when do I go on that? Maybe that's for another one. Another Ready one. to go. Spanish bitch from Uptown. I bought a bus down. <laughs>